Hi everyone, welcome to my lecture on artificial intelligence in brain research. My name is Kerstin Ritter, I'm a junior professor for computation neuroscience at Charity Universitätsmedizin Berlin and I've worked at the intersection of artificial intelligence and brain research since I started my PhD in 2008 and now I have an own research group on machine learning and clinical neuroimaging. In this lecture today I would like to address four questions. First, what is artificial intelligence, what is AI and what is deep learning? Second, how does AI and deep learning work? So here I would like to give a short introduction into artificial neural networks. Third, how can AI be applied in brain research, in particular in neurology and psychiatry? And fourth, what are challenges in applying AI methods in brain research? Let's start with the first question. What is AI? If you listen to the term of AI, then you all might have very different ideas and thoughts what AI is. So some of you may think mainly about certain applications such as robotics, self-driving cars, or computer programs playing chess or Go. Others may mainly think about weird people sitting in front of a computer and writing binary codes, and others may mainly think about ethical and societal consequences of these new technologies. But can we also give a more pure definition of AI? And I'd like to give you one definition here. So this is a definition by John McCarthy, one of the godfathers of AI, and also one of the guys who created the term AI. And he said in 1956, which is also the birth of AI, that AI is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. A similar but broader definition is given by Wikipedia. So here it said, AI is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and translation between languages. So there are two different or two important terms in those definitions here. One is intelligence and the other is machines or computer systems. So AI is mainly about creating computer systems or computer programs that solve tasks usually requiring some form of human intelligence. And since there are very diverse um, tasks where you require intelligence, there are also very diverse applications of AI. And now I would like to give you a more concrete idea of AI. So today when we talk about AI, we mainly, mo or most of the times, we mean machine or deep learning. So there's this broad field of artificial intelligence a subfield of artificial intelligence is machine learning, and a subfield of machine learning is deep learning. And traditionally, artificial intelligence has mostly been about rule-based learning. So you define a certain set of rules, give the rules to a computer, and then the computer sticks to the rules in order to come to a certain decision. Machine and also deep learning is different. So here the computer learns based on examples. So for example, you give a computer some images, images of cats and images of dogs, and the computer should figure out by itself to discriminate between those different object categories. Now the question is, how can you discriminate between machine learning and deep learning? And in machine learning, we use different methods. So if you use classical machine learning methods, then these mostly are decision trees, random forests, or support vector machines. Those methods usually require some kind of feat uh, prior feature extraction. And deep learning relies on the idea of artificial neural networks, and in particular deep artificial neural networks. And those deep artificial neural networks can help to learn complex representations of the data. And this is actually the main reasons why deep learning algorithms are so successful these days. And I want to show you here some um, uh, breakthroughs of deep learning in very diverse fields. So the first one is games. So in 2016 or 2017, the computer program AlphaGo has been invented by Google and succeeded in beating the world best Go player, Lee C. Dole. And this is very impressive because Go is not only a very complex game, but also a very intuitive game, um, which cannot be solved by calculating all the future moves. Another very important area is image recognition. So here we try to train the computer programs to see or to perceive the world. So for example, to discriminate between different object categories, for example, between cats and dogs, or between different uh, bird types, or between different faces or emotions on faces. 
this uh, is also very important for self-driving cars where also the car needs to perceive the world. Another application is in speech recognition. So here, for example, speech is translated into text and there are also some applications in psychiatry where people try to diagnose certain diseases such as schizophrenia or Alzheimer's disease based on speech. Another area which is usually not uh, associated with AI is art. So here the question is, can we also use AI programs to, to be creative, to create art? And I'd like to show you two examples here. So the first one is from Deep Art. So you see uh, the Bettenhochhaus of uh, Charité and then a, fine, a painting of Van Gogh. And using deep learning, it's possible to transfer the style from the Van Gogh painting to the image of the Charité. And this should show you in an intuitive way how these methods are capable of extracting relevant image features and use them for further processing. Another example is uh, in music. So um, this is a web page where you can uh, combine different styles of music pieces. And I'd like to show you an example where Mozart alla Turca has been combined with Rachmaninoff. <laughs> area I want to mention here is medicine and medicine we have very different types of data and many different research questions and clinical questions and I like to focus here only on neuroimaging data and the question if we can diagnose certain neurological and psychiatric diseases based on neuroimaging data. Now I would like to come to the second part how does AI and deep learning work so what happens in an artificial neural network so artificial neural networks are built from artificial neurons and artificial neurons are an abstraction of biological neurons. So you see um, a biological neuron with dendrites, a cell body and exon and you see an artificial neuron which is an abstraction. So you have some input data which are weighted and then summed up and then you have an activation function which decides if the sum is exceeding a certain threshold and then it decides if the neuron is firing or is not firing. And those artificial neurons are then stacked into each other in artificial neural networks and the simplest uh, architecture is the multi-layer perceptron. So here the neurons are organized in layers. We have some input data, for example images of cats or dogs. Then we have one or several hidden layers. If we have several hidden layers, then we are talking about deep learning. And in the end, we have one output layer giving us the probability of seeing a cat or a dog on the image. And this gives us then the prediction. And by comparing the prediction with the true label, which in this case is dog or cat, um, we can assess the goodness of the neural network. And when we start such a neural network, for example, with random weights, um, then the prediction are usually not so good. So we have some input data and then it's feed it through uh, the network and then we get some prediction. Uh, and usually in the beginning those neural networks do not work. So if they see an image of dog, then they say cat and the other way around. And now the question is how can we make those neural networks better? And this is about learning. And learning in neural networks means that we need to adapt the weights. So how do we need to change each weight such that the error decreases? And this is in the end a huge optimization problem. So we have the weights and we have the loss function depending on the weights. So um, just in a very simple case, if you have a two-dimensional coordinate system, then you have the uh, weight at the x-axis and the loss function at the y-axis. And then maybe you have a very um, simple function such as a convex problem and then you try to find the global minima. But for those neural networks, we don't on, only have one weight, we have like thousands or even millions of different weights. So this is a very complex function where we try to find not really a global minima, but a global, uh, a local minimum. 
Uh, they're very different um, architectures in deep learning, and I would like to focus on one particular um, architecture, namely convolutional neural networks. These are deep learning networks optimized for processing arrays such as images, and therefore they're perfect for analyzing imaging data. They consist of different types of layers, convolution, pooling, and nonlinearity. And um, the main idea here is that little filters are learned, and those filters are slided over an image in order to look for certain characteristics in the data. And the special uh, thing about CNNs is that they give you a graphical representation of the data. So, for example, in the first layers, uh, pixel intensities are perceived, then edges are detected, then objects, more complex objects such as eyes or nose are identified, and in the end whole faces are recognized. And those CNNs have led to state-of-the-art results in many medical imaging applications, including lesion segmentation, organ segmentation, or identifying cancer on different kinds of images. And the question now is, can this success only also be translated into brain research. And this brings me to the third question. How can AI be applied in brain research? And I would like to start with a short motivation here. As you might know, reading neuroradiological images is a highly sophisticated task requiring advanced education and a lot of experience. And usually those tasks are performed by well-trained radiologists. But a number of studies have shown that this diagnosis made by medical experts strongly depend on individual characteristics of the medical expert, such as age, experience, or perceptual abilities. And also those medical decisions are often influenced by bias and noise. And the question now is, can computer programs be better in solving some of these tasks? And the hope is that they're not only more objective, but also more sensitive in identifying subtle disease alterations. And here I would like to illustrate again the difference between machine and deep learning. So in classical machine learning, a lot of research effort has been put on identifying disease-relevant features based on neuroimaging data, such as volumes of certain brain structures, cortical thickness, or functional connectivity measures, which are then used in combination with the classical machine learning algorithms such as support vector machines or random forests. Deep learning is different, so deep learning is directly applied to the raw imaging data or minimally processed imaging data. So here we don't tell the algorithm what's important in the images, but it tries to find certain patterns by its own. And here again, always the CNNs are applied, and there are already some applications in neuroimaging. The input data are mostly structural MRI data. And there are already some applications, mostly in Alzheimer's disease, but also some in other diseases. And of course, the main question is now, is deep learning better than classical machine learning? And at the moment, we can't really tell. So there are some studies showing that we get higher accuracies when using deep learning. Uh, but there are also other studies showing that the deep learning accuracies are on par with classical machine learning uh, results. And there are even some studies arguing that with the current sample sizes we have, we do not really profit from deep learning approaches. To give you a bit of impression what we are looking in, in those images, I want to show you a few examples. So the first is from Alzheimer's disease. So here you see two um, coronal slices of one Alzheimer patient and one healthy control. And maybe it's now you could think for yourself um, what you think, which image belongs to the patient and which to the control. And if you get to your decision, also try to find some reasons why you think uh, the one image belongs to the patient and the other to the healthy control. The solution is that uh, the image on the right is uh, of the patient with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is characterized by neurodegeneration in the brain, and this is clearly visible in these T1 weighted images. So you see enlarged ventricles, you see cortical atrophy, and hippocampal atrophy. Now I would like to show you another example, multiple sclerosis. So here you see two axial slices. Um, of an MR image, one of the patient and one of a healthy control. And please think again what you think, uh, which image belongs to the patient and which to the control.
So here the patient is on the left. Um, MS is an autoimmune uh, disorder which is characterized by small spots of inflammation which, uh, which are called lesions and which are clearly visible on these flare images. But it's quite important to keep in mind that those lesions are not specific for MS but can also occur in uh, healthy controls. And the last example I would like to show you is in schizophrenia. So here the same task, which image belongs to the patient and which to the control. So here the patient with schizophrenia is on the left, and this is an almost impossible task, even for a medical expert to detect um, the patient here. You might think that the healthy person has a bit uh, like a more noisy uh, image, and this is true, but this is not disease relevant here. So generally, for neurological diseases, we have relatively clear biomarkers, but in psychiatry, it's much, much more difficult. And here also, there's the hope that using more advanced techniques, including deep learning, um, that we can find more subtle differences between different groups and psychiatry. So what are the challenges? This is my last question. And I think I um, said it before, the largest challenge are small sample sizes. So we don't have millions of images to train our algorithms on. So we usually have much less data, usually a couple of hundreds or a couple of thousands. The largest database we have access to is the UK Biobank. Here we have MRI data of 40,000 subjects, uh, but most disease-specific databases have much less data, and if we want to analyze local hospital data, for example, in charity, then we usually have even less data than in the um, other more open clinical databases. There are different ways to deal with um, small sample sizes, and I would like to show you one solution here, uh, which is called transfer learning. So transfer learning means that we do not train two separate models for two different data sets, but that you infer some knowledge from a model which you already trained on some data set. How does this work? So we transfer the weights from one uh, network to another and use this as an initialization. And this has been shown to work quite well, even across domains. And we looked into this in neuroimaging. Um, so we wanted to discriminate between patients with a mass and healthy controls. And we had a rather small cohort here. Therefore, we pre-trained our networks on the ADNI database with patients of Alzheimer's disease and healthy controls. And we've seen here that we considerably uh, could increase the accuracy from uh, no pre-training, 71% to 87% with pre-training. And in addition, also the heat maps explaining the individual decisions are much more concise um, for the pre-trained network. Also, this was some excess. It's not quite clear under which circumstances a transfer learning works best. And this is something we are investigating in this newly built CRC funder. So should we also always have a very large source data set or should we try to match the data sets with respect to task similarity, also data set similarity? The second challenge I'd like to address here is the so-called black box criticism of machine and deep learning methods. Especially deep learning methods usually result in a very good performance, but at the cost of interpretability. What do we mean by this? This does not mean that there is some kind of magic behind uh, deep learning networks. In fact, they're really transparent, so you can look at each little weight which has been learned. But we mean by this that from a human perspective, it's difficult to make sense of all these thousands or even millions of parameters learned um, during the learning process. And especially in the medical field, we want to justify a certain medical decisions. And uh, this is really an active area of research in the computer science community, and I like to present here one approach to deal with this. And this is the generation of heat maps based on input data. So here this image indicates for each voxel the relevance or the importance of this particular pixel for the final classification decision. So here, for example, you see that the horse has not been classified because of um, some uh, horse characteristics such as the ears, but based on the emblem and the bottom. So this method is also a method to detect bias in data. 
And so the problem here was that in the training data, most of the images with the horses had also an emblem at the bottom. And then uh, the uh, deep learning algorithm just used the shortcut and just learned whenever there's an emblem, then there's a horse on, on the image. And um, in our research, we wanted to explain individual neural network decisions in Alzheimer's disease. So the motivation here is uh, we have an MR image, we feed this into a neural network, then we get a probability of 89% that this subject might have Alzheimer's disease. But just based on this number, it's really difficult to trust it, both from a perspective of the patient, but also from the medical expert. But if we give an additional explanation in form of a heat map, then this is the main to um, increase trust in such decisions. And in those studies here, we developed a transparent deep learning framework where we first train a, trained a CNN model to discriminate between MRI data of patients with Alzheimer's disease and healthy controls. We applied it to test data. And in the second step, we produced heat maps for each subject in the test set. And in this study, for example, we compared different ways of how to compute those heat maps. And we found that, in particular, layer-wise relevance propagation, a method developed by Wojciech Zamek and Klaus Robert Müller and others uh, in Berlin, is in particular useful for uh, explaining individual decisions in Alzheimer's disease. We also looked into explainability in multiple sclerosis in the study I've shown you before. So here the main question was, uh, given that the CNNs are completely naive towards the importance of lesions in MS, will the CNN still pick up the lesions or something else in the data? And we found that the uh, CNN indeed focus on the lesions, but interestingly, mostly on posterior lesions and not so much on um, anterior lesions. And this can also be at least partially be explained by the true lesion distribution in the data, where also the MS patients had proportionally more lesions in, um, in the posterior areas than in the frontal areas. But in addition to uh, um, the lesions, we also found some other areas, including thalamus, for example. Uh, the third challenge I'd like to address here is bias and confounding variables. You probably read in the news sometimes that AI algorithms are biased, that they discriminate towards age and sex and um, ethnicity. So, for example, um, if image recognition software works better for light males than for dark females, or an AI algorithm for detecting skin has mostly been trained on white skin and not on dark skin. And those bias and confounding variables are almost everywhere, and especially medical data sets are usually not as representative as you might hope for. So it's really important to deal with those confounding variables and also to, to detect if there's some bias and if there's bias then to deal with it. And I'd like to show it um, now for our kind of data sets we have. So we have neuroimaging data, we have certain variables we want to predict, such as disease diagnosis, and there are potential confounding variables, including sex, age, comorbidities, or imaging size. And those potential confounding variables can influence both the images, but they also are, uh, can be correlated or associated with the variables we want to predict. And it's really important to look into, um, into those connections in a data set. And I'd like to show you an example here from the TRR265. So here we wanted to predict binge drinking in adolescence. And for this, we analyzed the Imagen data set. Um, here we have MRI data of adolescents uh, at the age of 14 years, 16 years, and 21 years. And there are two bias in the data set. First, sex. So uh, male adolescents tend to drink more than female adolescents. And second, uh, imaging side. So adolescents in the UK tend to drink more than adolescents at other European sites. And in this study here, we compare different machine learning algorithms, different outcome variables, and also different confound correction methods. And here in the upper left, you see the analysis where we did not any confound correction. So we wanted. Uh, uh, to predict from the images, which are X here, the binge drinking variable, and you see it's significant. Um, but you also see that we can just use the confounds, sex and side, to predict uh, the binge drinking variable as well. And you also see that from the imaging data, we can decode uh, both bias. 
So this really shows that the analysis is confounded and that it's necessary to correct for those confounds. And in the study, we found that especially counterbalancing with oversampling worked best. So we destroyed the connection between the confounds and the binge drinking variable. And, but still, the accuracy is significant for nonlinear uh, classification methods. And this has been done in, in a kind of training data set. And then we tested it on, uh, on the holdout data set. And here we still get a significant um, accuracy. And what's interesting about it that we already see at the age of 14 that we can predict the binge drinking um, experiences lighter in life. And this is something we want to further investigate. So if, how we can characterize those uh, 14 years old. The last challenge I'd like to address here is the difficult translation into clinical routine. So I think it's mainly about diverging concepts. So machine learning needs lots of data, prefers standardized data, loves well-defined problems, depends on gold standard of labels, which is especially difficult in psychiatry, is computational expensive, requires methodological expertise, and is perceived to be a black box. And hospitals, on the other hand, protect the data, which is very important, but which makes it also difficult to share data between hospitals or groups. Are very heterogeneous, provide unstructured problems, have changing diagnostic guidelines. For example, the diagnostic guidelines for MS recently changed. They have not yet the right infrastructure for data management and computing, but this is also a field where there is a lot of effort to make things better. They compete with tech companies in getting experts and they require transparency and responsibility. And I think it's very important to work on trying to bring those concepts closer together. And especially it's important to, to acquire more and more standardized data. This is not only important for machine learning uh, algorithms, but also for uh, statistical analysis in general. To summarize, uh, I wanted to show you that uh, deep learning is a subfield of machine learning, which again is a subfield of artificial intelligence. So nowadays when we talk about AI, we mo mainly mean machine and deep learning. The most important neural networks in the analysis of imaging data are convolutional neural networks. They learn a hierarchical representation of the data and provide a huge potential for analyzing neural imaging data. But research is still in its infancy. We need large standardized data sets and more research regarding bias and confounding variables, transfer learning, and explainability. And if you're interested to hear more about it, I would like to recommend um, our podcast and learning program, Dr. Med KI. At the moment, it's unfortunately only in German, but it will be also translated into English at some point. So here in the first season, I mainly talk about AI and machine learning and deep learning and data science and why we need good data and give more like foundations. And in the second season, I'm talking with different uh, experts at Charité Universitets Medizin about their machine learning applications, for example, in oncology, drug discovery, nephrology, neurotechnology. And in the third season, uh, which we plan to uh, record in the next time, will be about translation and ethical questions. And with this, I'm finished. I would like to thank my awesome team for performing those analysis. I would like to thank my collaborators. I would like to thank the organizers to invite me to the summer school. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to write me. Thank you very much.